Good evening. Thank you for joining us for this introduction to mapping program. I'm Connie Cook. I'm a retired University of Michigan professor and administrator. And now I chair the community mapping project at Voters Not Politicians. We are proud to introduce our speaker tonight. She is Bridget Bly, a statistician who has been a longtime VNP, Voters Not Politicians, volunteer. Tonight, she will be providing mapping training for Michigan communities so that your community can tell the new Independent Citizens Redistricting Commission who it is and where it's located. This presentation will be Mapping 101, an introductory program. When Bridget is done, our panelists will answer the questions that you put in the Q&A this evening, not in the chat, in the Q&A, please. Our panelists are Linda Sattler, who will be moderating the Q&A. Linda is a statistician and an after-school teacher who also is a longtime VNP volunteer. Rick Sadler is a professor at MSU Flint and a mapping expert. Charles Beal serves as digital targeting director of Voters Not Politicians, and he heads VNP's redistricting project. And Sandy Serini Elser oversees both education and training for VNP's community mapping project. She is an attorney who has practiced law for over 30 years. Tonight's VNP tech assistant is Ellen Hanlon. She too is a VNP volunteer. She is a former project manager and taught global business at Oakland University. So we have a big team here and we're looking forward to our evening with you. If you have questions during the presentation, again, please put them in the Q&A, not in the chat, because it will make it easier for us to answer your questions. We are recording this session and it is also live streamed on Facebook. Now let me turn the mic over to Bridget Bly. Thank you, Connie. Um, can everybody see my screen? Yes. Yes, perfect. Um, as Connie mentioned, my name is Bridget Bly. Um, I grew up in a small town um, and that was the kind of place where if you wanted to get anything done, everybody had to work together. So I am thrilled to be um, a volunteer for Voters Not Politicians because if you are a voter in Michigan from any party, uh, then VMP is advancing issues that benefit all of us and that we can all work on together. Um, today, we're gonna be giving you a brief overview of the uh, Michigan's new Independent Citizens Redistricting Commission, uh, what your community can do to make sure its voice is heard by the commission and how to create a map of your community to present to the commission. Hold on a second. Try this again. I'm having a little trouble advancing the slide. Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, you might be wondering who um, VMP is. Well, VMP is made up of ordinary citizens um, like me who want to see democracy work better uh, in Michigan. Uh, we welcome all volunteers. Um, we're a grassroots organization and we're not affiliated with um, any political party or partisan agenda. VMP led the fight in 2018 to replace partisan gerrymandering with the Independent Citizens Redistricting Commission. We collected 425,000 signatures. Um, we engaged 6,000 volunteers to do that. And we triumphed first in the Michigan Supreme Court and then at the ballot box in 2018. But we still have work to do. Um, what we're working on now is to help communities contribute to the redistricting process uh, that we all worked for. 
So again, today, this is what we're going to talk about. I'll spend about 10 minutes running through where we are today with redistricting and how we got here. Um, we'll give updates on the commission meetings and where and when those will be. And um, But I'll spend most of the time discussing mapping software options um, that your COI can use, your community of interest can use to create testimony to put before the commission. And after we finish the presentation, we'll have time uh, for your questions. So what does Michigan's new redistricting process mean for your community? Um, because of Prop 2 passing, we have a brand new process in place, and that new process is going to return more political power to the people, um, which is Article 1, Section 1 of um, the Michigan Constitution. Importantly, the new redistricting commission um, ensures that everyday citizens, not politicians, not lobbyists, these are the people who will redistrict our state in a fair, impartial, and transparent way. And here are those everyday citizens who serve on the redistricting commission. This is a list of them. Um, in 2020, these 13 citizens were selected from over 9,000 who submitted applications. There are four Democratic Party affiliated commissioners. There are four Republican Party affiliated commissioners. And there are five non-party affiliated uh, commissioners. At least two from each of these three groups have to approve the final maps. So already we've got big improvement over the old plan. Um, so the commission, most importantly, has the important job of drawing the voting districts for three sets of elected officials. Um, and these are the maps you see here. Um, every 10 years after the census, these maps are redrawn to make sure that the voting districts have about equal um, populations. These are the maps that were drawn up in 2011. Um, the 90,000 or so people per district in the state house districts elect one representative to send to Lansing. The 260,000 people in each state house district elect um, a, a state senator to send to Lansing, and the um, 700,000 plus people um, in each um, congressional district elect a um, representative to send to the House of Representatives in Washington. Um, you may have heard that Michigan um, lost a um, congressional seat. So this map from 2011 has 14 districts on it that will be remapped to 13 districts. The other maps too will be re redrawn to account for deaths and births and Michiganders who move. Um, so in 2011, this process was done behind closed doors in Lansing. In 2021, this process will be carried out in an open, fair, and nonpartisan way by the new redistricting commission. And that is why 2021 is such an exciting year for citizens in Michigan. The commission, the new seated commission, um, has seven required criteria um, that they will use to draw the maps. Uh, most importantly, they have to follow federal um, laws regarding the equal distribution of population across the districts, roughly, um, and the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Um, but today we're going to be focusing on the third criteria, um, the role of communities of interest. So the Michigan Constitution specifies that the redistricting commission um, hold hearings and take what communities of interest say into account when redistricting Michigan. So this gives communities of interest a great opportunity to impact that redistricting process that they never had before. What is a community of interest? So when we're talking about community of interest here, we're talking, oops, we're talking about the communities um, as defined um, in the um, Michigan Constitutional Amendment. Um, and these are held to be, um, to include, but not be limited to groups of people who share cultural, historic, um, or economic interests. So for example, uh, um, an ethnic enclave, um, a um, historic neighborhood, a watershed area, a downtown development area, an agricultural growers association, these are examples of community and communities of interest. Um, communities of interest do not include relationships with political parties, uh, public officials, um, or candidates uh, for public office. Okay, so here's the timeline for the redistricting commission. It's tight. Um, the new maps um, will be approved as of November 1st, 2021. Um, because the census was so late this year, there's an effort to move that, that 
that um, deadline back. Um, but that deadline does mean that the commission holds, it's gonna hold its public hearings um, between May and June of this year. So starting right away. Um, and they are required by the constitution to hold at least 10 before their maps are drafted and five more to get uh, public feedback um, to those maps. Um, so again, uh, this is a tight deadline um, and the new maps, because the new maps have to be used in 2021 and they will continue to be used um, until 2031. Sorry, they have to be used in elections in 2022 until 2031. Um, the commission is required to hold 10 meetings before uh, drafting the maps. Um, it's great they've decided to hold 16. So um, here are the um, here are the the locations of the public meetings uh, that they are going to hold. Um, these public hearings will have all 13 um, commissioners in attendance. So this is a great opportunity to tell the commission uh, about your community of interest. Um, the commission will also be receiving public um, comment via email or regular mail or in the public um, comment section of a meeting. Um, and they will also have a public portal to receive um, public input. But these meetings are a great way that communities can show up and talk to the commissioners in person about their communities. As a quick reminder, this is the essentials of what um, what testimony before the commission should include, um, sort of the where of your community, that is where are the boundaries of your community of interest, and uh, to uh, a description of your community. What holds it together? What are the economic, historical, um, or um, any other environmental concerns you share, for instance? And, and all you have to we have to remember that while the commission will be drawing three sets of maps, uh, communities of interest will only draw need to draw one map of themselves. So again, here's our here's our goals um, um, to demonstrate a menu of options for creating a map for a community of interest, um, to offer the benefits and drawbacks of each method, and then to provide a better understanding for which of these mapping methods might work best for your uh, community of interest. Our starting point is that one type of map is not necessarily better than another. Um, if your community of interest decides to um, draw boundaries on a realtor's map or a AAA map or uh, create a Google map or use a representable um, mapping tool, all of these maps are reasonable options for showing the boundaries of your community of interest. But we will be going through these four types of maps um, and we'll be comparing them and showing how a COI can create a map in these mapping, via these mapping methods for presentation to the, to the commission. There are others, of course, these are the four we're gonna talk about tonight. So let's start with paper and pencil maps. Um, these are some examples. Um, this is obviously a, um, a driving map, <laughs> um, highlighted driving map. Um, the one on the right is a hand drawn on a napkin um, and uh, the one on the lower left is copied out of a, out of a book. Um, these may work for your purposes. Paper and pencil maps have really great benefits. They're, they're, they're quick and easy, right? Um, they offer a way for community members who face technological barriers to still submit a map that the ICRC, the commission can interpret. Um, and if, if it's a printed out Google map or a realtor's map or a school district map, then the scale is is obvious and um, there are often landmarks on that will help the commissioners uh, interpret that map when they get it. Um, there are potential drawbacks to using paper and pencil maps. One is getting it to the commission, right? So if it's a piece of paper, um, then you um, have to mail it or bring it to a, a public town hall. Um, of course, you could scan it or take a picture of it and upload it to the portal, but it's still a um, an image file. Uh, it won't be an actual um, something that's geocoded. Um, and there's one step between the commission looking at your map and being able to import it into their into their software program. And we don't know exactly how that'll happen, but um, but the, the paper maps are one step removed from that um, end process. So another alternative, an alternative you could do is making your map uh, with Google Maps. 
Um, a lot of people are familiar with Google Maps. Um, maybe you've made directions to your house for someone. Um, all you have to do is enter into a Google um, search bar the name of a place, Unadilla, Michigan, um, and click Maps. And there it is. Um, and at this point, um, if you are drawing a, if you're planning to draw a paper and a pencil map, you could print this map out, highlight it, mark on it with a pen, um, and um, submit that as a as a paper map to the um, to the ICRC. But you can do a lot more with Google. So let's uh, let's go on. Um, you will have to have a um, a Google account um, that has access to the Maps app. If you have a Gmail account, then then you do have access to the Maps app. But that's why the sign in um, is circled up on the upper right. So. All you want to do is to pull down that menu um, that's on the left there to your places. Um, and um, on the your places menu, um, click maps on the right and create a map on the bottom. Now you get a map that has some drawing tools on it. So you can see that red circle shows you how um, one tool for dropping pins, um, that's the blobby one, and one tool for drawing lines, um, that's the, the one with the lines on it. Um, so I'm going to um, make a map. My neighbors and I maybe form a community of interest um, centered on the use of the Lakelands Trail, right? We want to present to the redistricting commission because we want our legislators to support continued funding for the Lakelands Trail, for instance. So now I've zoomed in on the start of the Lakelands Trail um, and I have dropped a pin there, which I can name if I want, called um, Start of the Lakelands Trail. And I continue, I can continue zooming in and out and dropping pins. What I've done here is to drop five more pins so that you can see across the center of the map, the, um, the route of the Lakelands Trail. And now I'm going to, use, uh, going to use the drawing tool to draw an outline around that map. So I'm gonna start in one place and click and move the cursor and click and move the cursor until I've, until I've got back to the first place, to the starting point. Um, and at that point, uh, Google will shade that area, um, and um, they call it a polygon once the front, the first and last pins join up, and the first and last points join up, and I can, I can name that polygon, uh, the Lakelands Trail COI polygon. Um, I can then save my map, I can give my map a name, and I can write a description of it. So that may help someone who's interpreting the map. Um, and then I have a choice. Um, there's the menu for exporting that map um, in the one red circle. Um, and I can export it as a, um, I can print it out. I can export it as, a, as an image map to PDF. Um, or um, I can export it um, um, in keyhole markup language, um, KML. Um, and that kind of an export will be able to be imported directly into the uh, mapping software that the commission will use. So that makes it slightly easier for the commission to take my map and um, upload it and look at it in their own mapping software. Um, so that's a big um, benefit of using a Google map or one of the ones we're gonna talk about later on over using um, a paper and a pencil map. So again, potential benefits are that Google is familiar to people um, and you probably already have a Google account. Um, it has a lot of um, landmarks, roads, and rivers, so it's easy to find the places that you want to outline for your COI. You can use the satellite view and look for, um, you know, look from above, obviously. Um, and it's fairly easy to convert um, and upload to the commission. Um, it does have some potential drawbacks relative to the ones we're going to, the two programs that we're going to talk about next. It's not specifically de designed for this purpose. Um, so uh, it, it has, it, it uses straight lines and pins rather than um, some areas. So there might be some ambiguity about whether a particular um, street is included or not um, in your Google map. Um, if you're not familiar with Google maps, it might be just as easy to start with one of the other ones, representable or districtor. Um, and if you have a complex boundary, as you saw, I had to use straight lines. So if you have a jagged or um, curvy boundary, um, that's gonna be harder to represent accurately uh, in Google. So let's turn to these special, um, specially created software um, tools. 
Uh, the first one we're going to talk about is representable. Uh, representable.org is, uh, is easily accessible. You go right to that website and it's free to use. So here you are, um, just get started. Um, I should say representable has a, has a large amount of information about gerrymandering. I skipped over that part, but, um, and um, a lot of uh, helpful tools as you're going through it. Um, you can sign up, um, it's, it's free to sign up. Um, and so um, that's the next step. You um, pick adding a community um, and it's going to ask you where that community is. So you um, pull down uh, to Michigan. There's a contact sheet that you fill out. Um, and then um, there's a section of representable uh, that talks about the kinds of um, the, the, defining what a community of interest is and then asking what unites your community. So you'll get to this section and it has um, four questions about um, your activities, uh, what binds you together, economic interests. Um, and these are, this is the kind of information that you'll want to present to the, to the commission anyway. So representable has this nice feature where it puts the what of your community um, in the same package for export as the map itself. So the what and the where um, come together with representable. And you can fill out one or many of these um, sections. Um, give your name, you give your community the name. I'm naming mine again, the Lakelands Trail uh, COI. Um, and here's the mapping tool itself. Um, uh, and so this is the way that um, uh, representable shows the, um, the map. I'm going to zoom again to the starting point of my trail um, and get the right magnification here. Um, if you notice up here on settings, um, there are your drawing tools and there's a, um, there's a paint function that you're gonna use a lot. And then there's a um, selection tool size. So depending on the size of your community, you may be wanting to be grabbing bigger or smaller chunks um, at a time. So this is the way representable works is that you grab um, sort of spatial chunks um, by, um, by clicking on them. So as a first step, I have um, clicked on Hamburg and um, the tool has highlighted the census block groups around Hamburg. So, um, and that's how it works um, on census block groups. Um, if my COI was quite large, then of course, it would take me a long time to click through all the component parts of my COI. So I, at that point, would want to change to a larger selection tool that would select a group of 30 um, block groups. But at the moment, I'm clicking on one census block group at a time. And um, as I do that, uh, my map takes shape. Here it is after I've gotten about all of them in. Um, now, notice that I can't um, I can't subdivide these units. So I can't exactly duplicate the shape that I made on my Google map. Um, my CO on A are gonna have to decide what areas to include or whatnot. So for instance, the next thing that I click on is gonna add this big square part. Um, and maybe, maybe, that's, maybe we include that, um, maybe we don't. So um, here's my final map and I can um, click save if I'm happy with it to complete my map. Um, there is this, this terms of use that you have to um, agree to when you save a map in Representable, and there is a submit button here. But I just want to make clear that this is not submitting anything to the Michigan Independent Citizens Redistricting Commission. This is merely saving your map. Um, so again, you're going to have to submit it um, separately. Here's the export screen that you're going to see um, once you've um, saved your map. Um, you can save it or export it as a PDF. Again, that's an image file. Um, and, but you also have a geocoded way to export it that will be easier to upload to the, to the commission's um, public portal. And that's this um, GeoJSON file. So if, you, if you're going to uh, make it easy for the commission, you would export it as a GeoJSON file. And those can be uploaded direct, imported directly into the commission's mapping software. And that will be easier for them. Um, once you've saved the map in Representable, you can then look at, at various data layers, they're called. Maybe you want to overlay the 2011 legislative districts on it to see how, it, how, it, how your COI was divided up in the past. 
Um, this is just for curiosity's sake, you don't need to obviously submit these to the um, ICRC. So, um, oh, again, this is the reminder about just because you've submitted to representable doesn't mean it's been submitted to the public portal, you'll still need to do that. Okay, so what are the, the benefits are that it guides you through every step, um, provides comprehensive tutorials if you need them, both within the tool and also there's some great YouTube videos. Um, um, it's been ex it's been tested extensively with users in Michigan um, to make sure that it would work for us, um, and it often offers several ways to shape um, to save and export your map. Um, the potential drawbacks of using Representable are that it does use census block groups as boundaries. So if your COI is very small, minute, carefully defined, um, as you saw when I was doing my my map, um, the outlines of your COI are going to be a little bulky. Um, it's not designed for um, going back and changing a previously saved map. So if you did decide your COI was different, you'd have to go back and create a new map for it. And the data layers are, are um, somewhat limited. Representable does, however, have a great tool um, in its uh, partners dashboard. So I'm going back to the beginning um, screen for Representable again, instead of adding communities, if you choose partners, um, then you can collect, um, you can link others in your COI. You can send this link to other people who are in your community and everybody can create a map. Um, however many people you send the link to can submit a map um, and those will all be joined together um, in representable in your partner drive. This is an example of a map created with different inputs, put it, different maps uploaded by different users. Um, and you can see the shading um, shows the commonalities in those maps. Um, and so these maps are compiled together and now I can look at them as the leader of the CO, COI, I can look at them. And if you're a community leader trying to create a consensus about where your COI is located, this is a fabulous tool um, because you can see exactly where your community members think that your community um, boundaries are. And you can see who submitted which map. Um, so if you are planning, if you are, if you do have a community of interest that has um, members all over the place or there's no consensus, this couldn't be a consensus building tool. Um, okay, so Districtor um, is the fourth method we're going to be talking about. Um, Districtor is another um, very easy to access, free to use, um, special purpose um, software um, for drawing communities of interest. Um, so again, districter.org will get you there. Here's the, um, here's the um, landing page. Um, and as you go along, of course, you select Michigan. Um, and then make sure you select draw communities here. Um, uh, Districter has another way that it operates, but tonight, tonight since we're talking about drawing communities, um, you want to make sure you're drawing communities um, and not drawing districts. Uh, Districtor can work either using um, census block groups as Representable did, um, that would be the left-hand lower option here, or precincts. So um, let's see what this looks like uh, with precincts. Um, again, you have a map, you can zoom in and out, um, and you have, um, you have the same kind of tools that you have in Representable. So you have a painting brush um, and uh, and I've zoomed again in on Hamburg so that I can um, look at my Lakelands Trail map. Here's, a, here's the map um, that I created for my Lakelands Trail. You'll see it's slightly different shape than the map that I did in Representable because it uses precinct boundaries rather than um, census block groups. Um, and again, you'll see this um, blockiness that comes from um, using the precinct boundaries as the boundaries of my of my um, COI. In Districtor, oh, and you can see here, sorry, there's a brush size tool, so I could choose bigger and smaller um, size units in the same way that I did uh, in Representable. In Districtor, there's also data layers that you can add to your map. Um, you can add um, both sort of um, demographic information as well as um, current district lines, for instance. Again, none of these additional layers are necessary when you submit your map uh, to the commission, but you may be curious. Um, 
And again, um, when you click share, you have um, a number of different export options here with, with Districtor. Um, you can, again, print out an image file, a PDF, um, um, but you can also export, as you could with representable files that are directly importable into the mapping software that the commission will be using. So um, GeoJSON files, files would do that. Um, and also you can export um, as shape files. Okay. Um, in this, it, here is it, um, Districtor also presents you with a link so that you can send your, um, you can send your map um, for other people to look at. Um, you can also, we think you'll be able to link this to the, um, to the public portal, provide this in the public portal so that the commission will be able to see your map through this link. Um, Representable does this by emailing you this link um, and um, Districtor does it by presenting it right here. Um, in both cases, you could just um, cut and paste the URL in the, um, in the, um, uh, the, the window up here at the top and that would give you the link to your map again. So again, just to review, um, the benefits of Districtor are that it it's, has more options for choosing how and what kind of map you want to create. Um, uh, you can add landmarks to your map in Districtor. We didn't do any of that, but you can. Um, it allows you to use additional data layers um, that, um, that are a little more extensive. Um, and we didn't show you this, but Districtor allows you to draw multiple maps at one time if you want. Um, there are some potential drawbacks. Um, it's um, for first time users, you may, um, you have to learn how to use it. Um, and compared to representable, it has less guidance on um, creating a community um, uh, description. In Districtor, there's one small window rather than the four questions that sort of lead you through uh, what this uh, community description is that's available in, uh, in representable. So um, here's the same map, um, four different ways. Um, this is the um, sort of driving map of a highlighter version, um, the Google map, um, the representable map there in the lower left, and the districtor map. Um, and these are all reasonable um, ways that um, you could submit your, um, the map of your, of your COI to the commission. You may see immediately which way of mapping would make it best for your community, um, or it may depend on a combination of your, your community's goals, um, the orientation and familiarity of your community with using mapping software. Um, and these are just a couple of questions to guide how you would might know which tool to use. Um, if your community of interest, um, if there are really severe bound barriers to um, computers, to internet, to getting people together on Zoom calls, maybe a paper and a pencil map is, is the easiest way for you to go. Um, if you want to gather submissions using the partner drive tool and representable, um, then representable might be the way to go. Um, Districtor does have a way that you can ask, um, you can email them and ask them to set you up a partner drive in, in Districtor, but it's not as e easily accessible or easy to use as the one in representable. Um, does drawing your map with blocks, with census block groups or precincts, distort your map? Are you a smaller CE, um, COI where using those boundaries actually um, distorts your idea of where your COI, um, where the boundaries are? In that case, you might want to use a Google map that where you have more control over where those boundaries are. If your COI has boundaries on the other hand, on the other hand who are curvy, jagged, or impossible to draw with straight lines, then uh, Google might not be the, the tool for you. If you want to use data, data layers either to inform your map beforehand, um, that would lead you to go to Districtor, or just because you're curious about them later, um, you could use Districtor or Representable. That's easy to do um, with both of those methodologies. And again, are you if you're creating um, multiple COI boundaries, um, more districts than you'd want to use uh, district. But remember, uh, your final goal is a description of your community of interest, um, the, the what of your community of interest and a map. Um, in whatever form um, those take, um, that's what you'll want to um, get to the commission.
Okay, so we have just a bit more practical information about how you can submit maps to the ICRC um, and getting more help with your map making efforts. Um, so maps can be submitted in any of these ways, um, paper maps, including print out, printouts or screenshots, um, digital packages, and these would be the, um, including um, files like PDFs, which are image files, or um, files that have geocode formats, and this would be um, GeoJSON or uh, KML or shape files. Um, <laughs> The, the commission will have a public um, comment and map submission portal. Um, and this it, it's not open yet. Um, it is expected this week. Um, so, um, and that's where the definitive information will be about how you can submit your maps. So um, be sure to go to redistrictingmichigan.org. Um, and um, as this portal opens, there will be more information there on uh, what the guidelines are going to be. Okay. Um, yeah, sorry. Um, we also want to tell you what we know about how um, COIs can sign up to give testimony during the commission's 16 public hearings. Um, here's what we do know. Um, you're, you're going to have to arrive in person to get into a queue for in-person um, testimony, and they will be taking signups until 8 p.m. And I understand that anybody who's signed up um, at 8 p.m. will be able to speak sometime during the night, um, uh, two minutes per person limit. So it's going to go quick. So it at this point, it's very beneficial to think a lot about what, that, what testimony you will give during those two minutes. Um, there will also be public comment stations for accepting documents like your maps. Um, and if you plan to give remote testimony, um, then you have to sign up online um, the day of that uh, meeting. Um, but again, this is what we know at the moment. And so really for the most pertinent information, you should be going to redistrictingmichigan.org. So Voters Not Politicians has a resource page. Um, and that's right at the bottom there, um, www.votersnotpoliticians.com slash COI. Um, and we are putting on this page all the resources that we think will be useful for um, COIs to have as they go forward with this process of um, giving testimony to the COI, um, to the commission. Um, there'll be links to uh, representable.org, um, links to districter, um, there'll be a learning a video for learning how to use Representable. Um, there'll be other uh, tools in case you want to use a in case you want to submit a paper and a pencil map. Um, and we will be updating this page for um, submission of your of any maps to the redistricted commission. How the portal is going to work and what you will need to um, to provide. So if you only um, write down two links tonight, um, please write down. Um, um, voters.politicians.com slash COI and redistrictingmichigan.org. Okay, I'm going to uh, turn this back to Linda for the Q&A. Hello, everyone. My name is Linda Sattler, and I'll be the moderator for the Q&A. Um, we have uh, panelists, uh, Connie Cook, Sandy Serini Elser, Bridget Bly, Rick Sadler and Charlie Beal, all are with Voters Not Politicians. Um, I want to start with um, the some of the questions that have been answered in the Q and A, um, and I do also want to know some of the questions were whether we could have the slides or the presentation. The, uh, a copy of this presentation will be sent to all attendees, so you'll have a you'll have everything you just saw um, in the um, in the recording. So uh, there's a lot of good questions here. I see there's still one open question, but um, I wanna start with talking about, there were some questions with the mapping itself and maybe some um, uh, issues on whether or not uh, the difference between drawing a district and drawing a community. I know there were some questions about COI districts um, are they different than some of the um, bizarrely shaped current districts? And, and also um, there was a question on 
the precincts using precincts for are are they the predefined lowest common denominator? We must combine into COIs. So um, I'm hoping that uh, if somebody, if uh, Sandy, why don't you start with that? Just talk about that difference between um, districts, what the commission draws, and the the, the COI boundaries that we are drawing here with these mapping tools. Right, thank you very much, Linda. And thank you for the questions too. Um, so this is often confusing for communities. Um, your job is to just draw your community and it's the commission's job to take all of the maps that it gets and layer them. They'll have a computer program to do this, layer all the maps it gets and then um, figure out what's the best way to keep as many communities intact um, and then also comply with the other six criteria uh, in the, um, that, that Bridget had listed for drawing the maps. So yes, it is uh, one of the criteria is to have reasonably compact districts, um, but you know that may not be possible. If more communities want to go along like Michigan or something, maybe that's what the commission will decide to do. Um, so there, there was another part of that was precincts. I think Rick had a good answer on the precincts, didn't you, Rick? Yeah, just that precincts tend to align with school districts and municipalities so that any one precinct only needs to have one ballot. Um, but a uh, precinct may only include half of a community of interest, like maybe the south half of your precinct and the east half of my precinct have a really important community of, of interest. And, Maybe eventually there's some reason to con for localities to consider realigning their precincts, but that's not really what we're doing here. So the idea is just to draw the community of interest as true to form as you see it. Um, and then that's for everybody else down the line to, to worry about and trying to uh, make that work. Thank you. Um, and there's another question here, and this is probably a good one for you, Rick, as well. Um, can you define census block? I know you did it in the Q&A. If you could explain a little bit more about census block. And another similar question, does a user representative need access to census tract numbers or just the geographic location? So maybe there's some explanation we can go into there. Yeah, and I think Connie may, I don't remember who exactly, but someone may have answered the, the question of whether you need the numbers, and, and generally you won't need numbers for when you're drawing these maps. Um, but so census uh, tracts, block groups, and blocks are all different units of geography that get smaller and smaller. A census block is like a city block. A block group is kind of a, like a small neighborhood, and a tract contains maybe three to five block groups. Uh, tracts and block groups also fall with inside city limits, so you wouldn't see a tract or a block group bleeding over from one township into another, uh, which makes them kind of neat for packaging. Uh, and, and so in that sense, they're kind of like precincts, but their purpose is different. What the census does is it provides summaries of uh, the population in a block group or a tract. So the number of people by age, by race, their average income, the unemployment rate, uh, and people like me, geographers, can use all that information and kind of combine it with other information to understand mm -hmm. the characteristics of neighborhoods. Um, but yeah, so uh, for the purposes of redistricting, it, they're handy because they give us the number of people that live in those places, although ultimately precincts would be the way that they would be divvied up, um, I would imagine. Thank you. Um, there are just came some more open questions. Um, is there a way to figure out how many people are in each COI you draw? Do we have an idea of how many people will be in each district? Um, so um, Bridget, why don't you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so um, you can, your COI may have a certain extent um, and all those people that are, that are within the boundaries of your COI, of course, might not be members of your COI. Um, because we're all members of multiple COIs. Um, but any area that you draw on a, um, if for instance, a, a district or a map, you can see how many people are included in that, that area, that geographical area. Um, and they do that via the census. Um, but that doesn't tell you how many members of your COI are, are within that boundary. That may be information that you'll have to present to the, to the commission separately. You know, we're, 10,000 or there are 300 of us or something like that you might want to do separately because you won't get that information from the from the mapping software. 
Was there another part to that question? Um, there were, there were, uh, do we have an idea of how many people will be in each district? Oh, yeah, so Charlie may know, obviously the congressional districts, the US congressional districts are gonna get a little bigger um, because we're gonna have 13 instead of 14. Um, in terms of the other districts, I would imagine they're gonna get a little smaller because Michigan, it's gonna, they're gonna look a little smaller because Michigan's um, population has uh, decreased. Is that right, Charlie? Yeah, so, so our, um, now that we're going, oh, I'm sorry, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so now that we are down to 13 congressional districts in the state, um, we'll go up to about 760,000 um, or so people per district. Um, and then it looks like there'll be 260,000 uh, roughly per uh, state Senate district for the 38 Senate districts there, and then about 90,000 people for the 110 state house districts in Michigan. Thank you. Um, here, there, there are a number of questions, and I know, Bridget, you, you answered some of this in your talk, but um, about the actual testimony, can you just submit a map and description without presenting live or remotely? And there were some questions about whether it had to be live or remote. Um, Connie, do you want to answer that one? Yes, you can. The commission will have a portal shortly, as Bridget said, probably this week, and you can submit written and mapping testimony through the portal at any time. You don't have to show up to do it. And the commission is obliged to consider all the testimony that's submitted to it, regardless of how it is submitted. Thank you. Um, here's a question. Um, who wrote the computer program that will combine the maps into possible districts? Rick, maybe you can take a stab on what that one's asking about. <laughs> I, I'm not sure, no. <laughs> uh, Linda, maybe yeah. I could in here. Yeah, Charlie, um, go ahead. So the actual map drawing has not started yet for the MICRC. Um, they have um, a, a line drawing and technical services firm that they have contracted called Election Data Services. Um, it was my understanding during their original presentation that they would be utilizing Maptitude. Um, and I don't know, Rick, if you're familiar with that mapping software. No? Okay. Um, but um, the good news is, is they're, they're going to be choosing software that is widely compatible with several different formatting options. Um, so it's not something that um, you as an individual have to uh, think about as you're drafting your maps to submit. And, um, you know, the, the uh, districtor and representable, um, you know, took a lot of thought and consideration into the types of formats that they offer for you to be able to export uh, just to cover their bases. Thank you, thank you, Charlie. Um, here's, a, here's a good question. Um, so if you can't get nearby COIs via representable or districtor, will you be able to see that information on the commission's website? Will you be able to see, eventually, I guess eventually, other people's um, COIs? Um, Sandy, maybe? I... I can. Okay, Charlie. Great. Oh. Yeah. Well, I just wanted to mention that the public portal is going to be public. So any uh, public comment or maps that are submitted to the MICRC's portal will be viewable by the public. Um, and so you will be able to see the actual submitted maps and testimony mm -hmm. as it comes in through the portal once it goes live. Okay. Thank you. Um... Okay, here's, a, here's another good one. Does the MICRC consider the communities of interest related to whether it is a federal or state specific interest? Connie. I think that's a wonderful question because different COIs have different public policy concerns. And in some cases, their concerns are addressed at both the federal and the state level. And in other cases, it's just the federal level or just the state level. So I think it's very important for COIs as they testify to make it clear to the commission which level of government 
is of particular concern to them. If, if they are talking about state level issues, they want their COI to stay within the state house district, within the state Senate district. If they're talking about federal issues, they want their COI not to be broken into different congressional districts. Okay, thank you, Carney. Um, there's another one came up. Is there any chance state Senate map districts could be evenly divided into state house districts? Hmm. I, I didn't have a clue on that one. <laughs> Kelly? Yeah. So I hope I'm, I hope I understand this question correctly. Um, so in California, um, they, uh, I believe for every, every one Senate district, they have two house districts and part of their redistricting process was a process known as nesting, which requires you to build basically two state house districts. And that represents the state Senate district. Um, we don't have like a two to one ratio. I think we have like a three to one ratio between state Senate and state house. Um, but in either case, it's not something that you couldn't advocate for, but it's not an outlined requirement of criteria in our constitution. Thank you, Charlie. Um, I'm looking at some of the answered questions again. I know, Rick, you, you answered some of this, this one. Um, is this plan following any successful redistricting from other states? And along those lines, have other states followed these guidelines? Um, so. Um, I know Rick, you answered about which states were, were doing some redistricting processes. Does anybody else want to add to this question? I mean, I, I could just add a, a yeah. small addition here that um, what I followed of North Carolinas and Pennsylvanias, I was very encouraged by. I thought they did a good job. Okay. So hopefully we're following their example. <laughs> Thank you. Let me, um, we have time for one more question. Question. I think I've, I, we've gone over most of it. Yes, Connie. Uh, something we haven't mentioned tonight, but I think is important, is that when COIs testify before the commission, they can talk about other COIs that they have similar shared interests with. Uh, they can say, here are our boundaries, and we share interests with these people or these people and we don't share interests with those people. And the commission will want to know which other COIs you'd like to be with or you think have very different needs and objectives. Thank you, Connie. Um, so somebody, um, there is a question about tonight's, uh, wanting to get tonight's slides other than the recording. Um, I think that if slides will be in the recording, so I'm not sure if those are gonna be separate. Um, great question. I can, um, I'm more than happy to, we've actually put our uh, previous uh, presentation, uh, slide presentation documents on our website. Um, we'll continue to do that with this presentation as well. Um, so you can always go to votersnotpoliticians.com slash COI. Uh, when you head down to the mapping toolkit, you'll see a recording of tonight's presentation, as well as a slide deck that you can download um, by tomorrow. Okay. Um, I, I, there's, there's one last question. I'm just going to answer real quick. If you have not joined together with a particular COI in your overall community, what is a good way to get involved in the mapping process? How to find out who is working on maps in your community? Anybody? Well... well it, there's no easy way to find out who else is working on maps, except ultimately by going to the commission's website to see who else has submitted maps. But there are other groups besides VNP that are out trying to find and support COIs, such as the League of Women Voters and the Michigan Nonprofit Association. So if either of those groups happens to be active in your community, you can bet that they probably have found some COIs that they're supporting. Okay, great, thank you so much. Um, I think that's all the time for questions we have. And I want to um, thank so much to Bridget for um, her wonderful presentation and to our panelists for helping to answer all the questions. 
the links to contact VMP um, and the online mapping tools are in the chat. Uh, so, and please, please fill out the feedback form for this presentation. The link is also in the chat. Um, if you come up with any more questions, please don't hesitate to email us. Thank you for participating in this important event. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.